Good evening. Thanks for tuning in to the third event of the Whistling Hens Virtual Residency at Collington. Um, if you've tuned in before, you've already heard a little bit about how this came to be, but I'm going to mention it again for our first time listeners. Last October, Whistling Hens applied for the Chamber Music America Residency Partnership Program grant. Uh, Chamber Music America is a very famous and large granting organization for classical music groups. Well, we won the grant, obviously, which was very exciting, but then we were faced with a completely different reality than the one we had proposed in October. It was clear that due to COVID-19, we'd have to do some sort of remote or virtual residency instead, because my duo partner wouldn't be allowed to come on campus for these performances, which of course was a good decision um, made in order to keep everybody as safe as possible. We're lucky and thankful that Chamber Music America was open to the idea of our virtual residency. So tonight's concert is one of the events we had to put together to entirely remotely. Normally in a lecture recital, Jen and I would both talk a little bit about each piece and we would demonstrate certain techniques and features. We've changed our format a little bit this time, so I hope you'll enjoy that adaptation. Before I start, I will remind you that you can visit www whistlinghens.com slash cma and there you'll find our program booklet and you can also fill out an online survey about this event when it's over. We are really really interested in getting your feedback since we aren't able to engage with you in person um, like we would at a live concert so please take the time to fill that out. There's also a paper version at the end of your program booklet. Now, tonight's program explores some of the uh, interesting, fun, and demanding techniques that we sometimes encounter in music that maybe falls outside of the realm of traditional classical music writing. The first one that we're going to talk about is not actually a performance technique, but a compositional one. So one of the challenges of being a clarinet and soprano duo is that there's very little repertoire available for this specific instrumentation because it's not really standard or not particularly well-known grouping of instruments. As a result, when we were first looking for repertoire to perform, we were stuck with a really, really limited selection. One way we got around this limitation is just by com uh, commissioning music, and you've already heard some of those commissioned new works in our other programs. But the other way we got around this is by transcribing music that was for soprano plus another instrument to clarinet. So for example, because we're all upper woodwinds, if I found a piece that was for soprano and oboe or maybe soprano and flute, it could potentially be a good candidate for me to rewrite for clarinet instead. So this approach to transcribing works opened up a lot of repertoire to us. And to date, I have transcribed five works for Whistling Hens. And I'll tell you now about the first transcription I did, which is Rebecca Clark's Three Irish Country Songs. Now this was originally for soprano and violin. There's a very different set of challenges when you try to transcribe a piece of music that was for a string instrument and translate that to a wind instrument. Um, so first of all, a string player doesn't need breaks in the music to breathe because their instrument doesn't depend on their breath to produce a sound. Secondly, string players have techniques that are specific to their instruments, which aren't actually possible to do on other instruments. One example of that would be the pizzicato technique, which is when you pluck the strings of the instrument rather than bowing them. So how do you translate that to clarinet? Because we can't pluck our clarinet, you know. Um, and thirdly, string players can play more than one note at a time. So you might have seen this. It's similar to what you've seen on a guitar, where you hold down multiple strings and you strum and then you get chords. On a wind instrument, we can really only play one note at a time. So these three areas really make it difficult to transcribe from violin to clarinet. And because of the instrument differences, I ended up making some compromises in the music to make it playable on clarinet. And I'll just show you a few quick examples so you get an idea of what I'm talking about. So the first example I have from you is from the first movement of three Irish country songs. I have for you the original voice and violin part. And in that red box, you'll see that on the second beat of the measure, there are actually two notes stacked on top of each other. So like I mentioned earlier, it's not really possible for the clarinet to play two notes at once, so I have to decide what I'm going to do about that. 
Additionally, that specific technique is the one that I mentioned earlier called pizzicato, which is plucking the strings of the violin, which also I can't really do on clarinet. So something I was thinking about was how can I translate that same sound quality or that effect to the clarinet? And the solution that I came up with was this. To get the effect of a pizzicato, I've marked that the player should play it like a dotted note with a tenuto. So that gives it, to me, that implies a short note, but with a little bounce to it, like, like a string pizzicato. That's how I personally notate it. And then the way that I chose to uh, eliminate one of those notes that happened at the same time is when I looked at the chord, it looks like there's actually, in the first instance, it's D and D, so they're an octave apart. It really actually doesn't matter that much which note I pick because pitch-wise they're the same, they're just displaced by an octave. So I chose to use the lower octave because um, it sat more comfortably on the clarinet and it also felt harmonically like the right choice because it felt like sol, do, sol, do. And if you're familiar with singing and music, then in you might intuit that a little bit from what you're going to hear when we perform the piece. The second example is from the second movement and I've highlighted in red here the first three measures and you can see all over the place there are um, pitches happening simultaneously and I've already mentioned how I get around that but at the bottom you'll see what my solution was where I just have to end up picking one of those notes. And one of the ways that I do it is by listening to recordings of the original instrumentation. So I'll listen to the recording that's for soprano and violin, and I'm listening for what my ear gravitates towards in the violin part. So does it make more sense for me to pick the uppermost notes from that gesture, or should I pick the lowermost notes from that gesture? What's sticking out more in the recording? Because then I want the clarinet to pick those notes so that it is most similar to the composer's original intent. And in this case, I did choose the upper note for almost all of it because orally we hear higher notes a little bit more and it sounds more melodic. And the third example is also from this movement. Um, this, was, this was definitely trickier. So I've got these red lines here, which show you the general direction, melodic direction in the violin part. And if you've ever sung before, or even when you're speaking and you're thinking about pitch and how everything relates, it's a little bit easier when pitches are what we call stepwise. So they move gradually from one to the next. There aren't any big leaps. So if you're singing, it's easier to go ah than ah, ah, ah and have bigger leaps. So when I was trying to choose what notes I would play from this violin part, since I can't play two notes at once and it kind of moves all over the place, my original thought was I'll just follow the m most melodic contour. So whatever leaves the least amount of space in between each note, that's probably the most natural feeling. And it actually did work pretty well. It sounded nice in our recording sessions when I was trying this piece out. But something I noticed is that when I went back and listened to the original recordings for soprano and violin, there was a different chord quality or a different mood when I listened back that I wasn't capturing in my personal transcription. And the reason for that is by only going by the most melodic line, I had actually left out some of the juicier notes, what, maybe what you would think of as a blue note in jazz, the spicy ones that stick out a little bit more. And on this slide, I've circled those notes for you. So they're circled in blue at the bottom, um, and they're the notes that are on the bottom half of the melodic line. So the very first one you'll see at the left, if you, if you read music, that's an F natural. That really sticks out in this key because F, F natural, it's supposed to be F sharp if we're in the, in the correct key. So I decided to change my approach to pick the notes that fit the composer's harmonic mood best. And it's hard to really articulate unless you're to hear both recordings back to back, but um, that's how I ended up changing my approach so that you got a little bit more of the spicy notes, which were closer to what the composer wrote, even though I still had to leave out a different note. And that's what you're going to hear in our performance of this piece.
I think Natalie did such a great job on that transcription, and it's always so lovely to sing those pieces with her. The next piece we have is called Thursday, and it's been written for us by DC composer Ashy Day. If you watched the composer event on Friday, you heard Ashy interviewed, and then her piece, The Green Child, performed. And she just recently wrote The Green Child for us. Thursday was written last year, also for us, and it's a poem by Edna St. Vincent Millay, but I have my music with me because I want to read you some of the very interesting instructions that Ashi gives us. Um, you may have noticed with The Green Child the storytelling element, and even though Thursday is only three pages, it includes that same storytelling element that's really important in Ashi's work. So right at the beginning, it says, Thursday, a brief scene for clarinet and voice. So we already know this is going to be dramatic. The two lines in the music are labeled. One is soprano and one is clarinet. However, underneath soprano, it says the spurner. And underneath the clarinet, it says the spurned. So I will be spurning Natalie. Um, the interesting markings at the beginning of the music for me it says joyfully callous throughout and for Natalie it says happyish and nervous and you'll hear Natalie popping up doing grace notes from one octave to the other and I sing a little bit back to her and she's getting upset because I'm not being very kind but I love this next section and I want to read you the instructions here I say and why you come complaining. And then this next section, Ashi specifically says, complaining solo section. Liberally use squeaks and squawks as so moved. The effect should be that the clarinet sounds as if it had an outburst, a brief tirade full of protests, complaints, and perhaps a sob or two. It should be fun, but not pretty. And I have to tell you, when we were learning this piece, Natalie plays wah, 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 wah at one point, and every time we rehearsed it, I could not stop laughing. I thought it was so funny. Um, eventually, I put my actress face back on and made sure I didn't laugh anymore. As we finish the piece, you'll hear that Natalie is encouraged to still use a lot of bending and falling in her pitches as we're going along. Um, and then at the very end, she is, uh, as she writes, that she should be despondent because, of course, the soprano has spurned her. Uh, at the very end, she also tells us that rhythms in the soprano part should be performed with some flexibility and variation, as one would do with a Broadway or jazz standard. As the clarinet part gets more upset, the player can add effects to the written notes, such as squeaking and squawking sounds. For both performers, but particularly the clarinet, consider the emotional intent behind the notes and play them in a way that portrays that, which me can mean some altering or adding of additional dynamics, articulations, effects, etc. So the fun thing about this short little piece is that we can create the drama on our own, and it's a little bit different every time we perform it because we're allowed to do some improvising. Um, and I... I always enjoy this with Natalie because every single time we perform this, it feels very fresh and very exciting. This is Ashy Day's Thursday.
Our next piece is called Meadow Song, and this is by a Czech composer named Iris Zegi. And in this piece, you're really going to hear a lot of interesting techniques for both the voice and the clarinet. I don't sing a lot of actual text until the very end. Most of the time, I'm just making sounds. And the way it's notated in the music, you see just D-U or J-A. And the composer in the opening tells me how she wants those things performed. But it's really difficult because right from the beginning, I start on an A below middle C and I jump up two octaves within a, just a couple of beats. This is not a typically easy thing to do. It takes some practice. Um, I also have to work, had to work hard on learning to really be able to hum comfortably way up high in the voice. It's easy to do in the middle of our voice. Mm -hmm. Sure. But when you go up really high, you have to make some adjustments. So I had to play a lot with how to hum up in my high register. And then on top of that, I also get to yell in this <laughs> And learning to yell in a way that doesn't exhaust me for what comes afterwards was also really difficult. Um, this piece is rhythmically challenging as well as the pitches are challenging. So getting all the pitches in my ear without a piano to help me also took some time. And then at the end, I sing a little bit of a Slavic folk tune in a Slavic dialect. And the words mean, she raked and raked and raked, nothing. Then she broke the rake out of great sorrow. Now I'm gonna let Natalie tell you about some of the really cool things she's gonna do on clarinet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like Jen already said, there's a lot of interesting techniques of what we call extended techniques that aren't necessarily typical for what you would see in a piece of classical music. And the very first one you're going to hear is the first note of the piece. In the clarinet, the composer has written an instruction that she calls air tone, which means to play the note with the instrument, but also create an airy sound quality to it. So it's very, very soft and you'll have to listen closely to hear that, but it happens on those on those low A's that Jen was talking about. And that's what that, that kind of crackly white noise sound is. It's specifically there as per the composer's instructions. There's some other things like flutter tonguing, for example, which kind of sounds like it's a growly noise on the instrument. And you achieve that by rolling your R while you have the clarinet in your mouth. So it's like, but I do that with the clarinet in my mouth and that's what produces that, that crazy sound. Um, there are things like glissandos where you kind of like with your voice, it's very easy to, to go whoop, and it goes up or down and you do that glissando. But on the clarinet, we have keys and buttons and it, there's a different technique to achieving that kind of smear effect um, going up and down. Um, and then another technique you'll hear is one that's called slap tonguing. So it's a very, very specific technique that's mostly found in saxophone literature, and it has to do with applying suction to the mouthpiece of the clarinet um, with the reed. And when you release that suction, it makes a popping sound, um, which you can do kind of with your teeth even. It's, got, it's that same idea. You get that pop sound on the reed because of the suction. And it creates a percussive articulated effect that's many more sound than, than the notes that you'll hear around it. And as Jen already mentioned, she gets to yell. And while she's heading up to do the yelling, I'm also um, going really high in the stratosphere on the clarinet, much, much higher in the range than what you would typically see. And that part of the clarinet is called the altissimo range. So that's our very highest notes. Um, if you read music, this is this is notes that are usually at least four ledger lines above the staff. And that's that that's the extreme range that you're going to be hearing there. And other than those very specific extended techniques. This piece is very unique and different in how it sets the clarinet in voice. One element being related to what Jen mentioned about not having a piano to rely on for pitch. In all of these figures, the soprano is the one who leads the melodic contour. So she doesn't have me as a pitch reference to rely on for these very strict tonalities. And so it's testament to her excellence as a performer of how accurate and um, 
uh, just really amazing she is at capturing these very, very strange intervals. Um, and finally, the piece ends really softly and slowly, you know, ending with great sorrow. And you'll hear that as we fade away into nothing in that, in the kind of white noise, expansive feeling that opens the piece. We hope you enjoy Ira Shegi's Meadow Song. The next piece I want to talk about is It's Bedtime by Danielle McBrien. 
Now, Danielle is one of my friends. We met, oh, I think I was in 2013. I went to a summer music festival in Canada for a wind octet workshop, and I met Danielle there. She's a fabulous oboist, and she's also a composer. And she wrote this piece for Whistling Hens in 2019. It has a very unique challenge for the clarinetist, and that is the challenge of there not being anywhere to breathe at all. So I'm going to pull up a picture of that so you can see what I mean. So this is the sheet music for the clarinet part of It's Bedtime. And yes, I do partially have this up here so that you'll feel sorry for me. <laughs> it's three pages of really fast music without really anywhere to breathe. So uh, on this slide, I've circled for you the very first opportunity to breathe, which is at the bottom of page two, got two beats of rest. Um, and then there's another measure a couple bars later of rest. But other than that, it is just straight through playing. So this presents a unique challenge for me. How am I gonna do this if I'm not able to find a spot to breathe? My solution was to circular breathe this entire piece. And I'll demonstrate that for you now. This technique, circular breathing, is actually, it's a misnomer. We're not really breathing in a circular manner. What we're doing is exhaling air, stale air, while we are inhaling at the same time. And there's one way that you can just try this from home. I'll show you the steps without a clarinet and you're at home, you're quarantined. So even though this looks silly, you're alone. So give it a shot, see what it feels like. Nobody's there to judge you. So first you can just try, start out by puffing out your cheeks full of air and just breathing regularly through your nose. When I do this, I do have air stored in my cheeks like a chipmunk, and I'm still breathing through my nose, right? So stale air here, uh, real air is coming through my nose. Now, what if I wanna get rid of that stale air while I'm breathing in? I can do that by forcing the air out with my fingers like this. So I'm pushing the air out with my fingers while I inhale at the same time. Now, if I'm gonna do that on the clarinet, I'm not able to use my fingers to push that air out, so I've gotta do it with my cheek muscles. And that takes a while to develop, but it looks like this. So I like to think of moving my muscles like I'm squeezing a tube of toothpaste towards the front. That's the direction that the, my muscles are going so I can push that air out quickly. So the final step of circular breathing, well, I guess other than putting it on the instrument, is syncing up that process of exhaling, pushing out that stale air and inhaling at the same time. So I'm gonna try to sniff really loudly while I push that air out so you can hear what that process is like. So don't try any more of it at home. I don't want you to hyperventilate, but that's what's going on um, in the clarinet part here. It takes a long time to learn how to do, or at least for me it did. I spent about a month practicing circular breathing just with a cup of water and a straw. So you can practice it by blowing bubbles into the water and practicing your airflow that way. It took about a month for me to do it that way. And then I put it on the clarinet. And even today, I'm still working on making my circular breathing better so that it doesn't have bumps in the sound or any weird gaps. Um, so I hope you enjoy this uh, very technically demanding piece that features, uh, if you're wondering why I'm, I'm looking like a, like a frog at some point, this is exactly why.
Slider is fast becoming a good friend of Whistling Hens. I first met Charisse two years ago at the Music by Women Festival, and then last year Natalie and I were at the Women Composers Festival of Hartford, and we heard her American Folk Suite performed by flute and soprano, which is its original version. If you watched the Music and Literature event, you will have noticed we performed that work but in a version for soprano and clarinet. We knew we wanted her to create something like that for us, and we asked her to do it, and she did. We also knew we wanted to create something bigger with her, and so last summer we commissioned her to create this next piece, Eve's Diary. She started out by suggesting that she had been reading Mark Twain's Eve's Diary and wanted to create a sectional work that reflected what he wrote. So last summer, while we were in residence at Avalok Farm Music Institute, we talked almost daily with Charisse on the phone about the possibilities of this while we were also working on the transcription for American Folk Suite. And what is happening in this piece is that Eve is one day old and she's recognizing her surroundings. The piece starts by the clarinet sort of evoking the nature that's around, and then Eve starts to find her voice. And she walks around her whole new world and she's very curious and excited and joyful for what's happening in the world. And she wonders if she's some kind of experiment. As we go through, there are times where I am singing and sometimes where I'm talking and Natalie does some falls with her clarinet and then I fall with my voice and we play around a lot together. Um, when we get to the end of the piece, Eve has found the other experiment and she's following him around but you know he's not as curious and brave as she is and he kind of runs away. 
We hope that you enjoy Eve's Diary, which we premiered this past September in Baltimore.
went home. Thank you so much for joining us for the third program in our residency here at Collington. We've been having such a great time putting this all together for you, and we're just sad we can't be together in person while we're doing it. But we do have one more event left. It's this coming Wednesday, July 15th at 7 p.m., and it's called Music and Mementos, and we'll be talking about how certain objects in our lives create emotions and how that connects to some of the music that we perform. We hope you'll join us then and see you soon. Bye.